wonderful. All right. Welcome to the Lovecraft Easing podcast at a special time. Uh, and my guest is Katrina Ward. How are you? Hi, I'm very well. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, no problem. So you wrote a book, several books, actually, but your newest book is The Last House on Needless Street. So we'll talk about that which I think we can probably talk about it for about 30 seconds before we get into spoilers. <laughs> I've so, got very good at talking around it as opposed to talking about it. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, so you were going to be on the show last Sunday yeah. and I, I didn't hear from you. And I thought, okay, she's um, <laughs> um, busy or something, or she's going to, you know, I, I didn't know what to think i was just hoping is she okay and then you got back to me with this adventure that you had yes. um so that's the first question i want to ask you tell me about the adventure why did i stand you up no um yes i, <laughs> I, I am not your fault god it was it, it was really dramatic as excuses go it, get, it doesn't really get any better um so i teach almost every year i teach a gothic literature course in this very, very remote house. It's actually, I don't know if you're familiar, that, that there's a poet, um, an English poet, who's, he's dead now, who used to live in this house. He's called Ted Hughes. And he owned this incredibly romantic house on the Yorkshire Moors um, called Lumbank. And I, was te I, I teach every year this, um, you know, I teach about 20 people um, with this um, organisation called Arvon. Mm -hmm. And it's on, the, on a remote hillside. It was so cold. And um, on the uh, they because uh, it's up north, it's very it's it's much colder than down south in London where I live. I came completely unprepared. I mean, I was yeah. wearing not not flip flops quite, but almost. <laughs> and um, everybody up north is very kind of you know weather weatherproof and kind of good with the you know, howling gales. And I woke up um, in on I'm just due to come home on Saturday after finishing the teaching. And on Friday night about three a.m., I woke up and I thought something's different something's different and I suddenly realized that there were no um there was no noises little noises or lights and in fact we'd had a, we had a power cut and then I thought something else is different and I looked out the window and there was like all I could see was snow and this this house is at the bottom of very very steep lane it's about maybe a mile and a half and you can't drive down so all the cars are parked a mile and a half away up this hill so with no <laughs> no power, no taxis, um, no phone signal, no Wi-Fi, um, we all had to set out with our bags on our backs, like up this hiking a mile through the snow. And when we got up to the car, the car wouldn't start. We had to like get oh my gosh. To, like, yeah, we had to scrape the thing, everything, all, all the snow off it. Um, and then when we finally got it going, there was no power anywhere in in the surrounding area. So the, the traffic lights weren't working. There were trees down all over the road. So we were like swerving around these trees and just guessing that there was no one there. Um, anyway, it took, and then when I finally got to a train station, I had to make my way because the trains were running very, very slowly. I had to make my way like almost station by station southwards, just like hopping on and off these little tiny local services, like shivering after this mile long hike in the snow with my bag on my back. Anyway, I got to London at like, at like midnight on Friday and I just passed out and I didn't get your I didn't get to your message until the next day, for which I apologize very much. Oh, I think that's the best excuse I've ever heard, actually. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it was... it's way above uh, the cat ate my homework or something like that. <laughs> it's wonderful so. because everybody else really enjoyed it. They 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 were um extremely they were kind of like enjoying the adventure. I wasn't. I was no, like no, no. it's I not an home. adventure at the time, is it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, yeah, it's an adventure late later. Yeah. <laughs> now it's an adventure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you just had a book come out called The Last House on Needless Street. It's actually your yes. third book, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, you can show the audience. With, oh, yeah. That's what you're gonna do. Yeah, please. I was, yeah. I've just noticed as well that you've got this beautiful background on, which is... Yes, I don't know where I got that, but it's pretty it's cool. beautiful. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it looks very familiar. For those who are listening later, it's part of the book cover. So, mm. and it looks very gothic. So, so yeah. Okay, so as much as is possible... Uh, could you give us a spoiler-free synopsis of this book? Because my goal is um, there'll be people listening and watching to this who have read the book, but there'll also mm. be many people mm. who this is the first time they've heard of it, so I don't want to, 
you know, spoil it for them. So absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, briefly, so this um, is the last house on Neither Street is about Ted, um, who's a very strange, reclusive man who lives in a, bo a boarded up house. All the windows boarded up with just sort of little coin sized eye holes to look out of um, uh, at the end of Needless Street. Um, and he lives with his uh, 12 year old daughter, Lauren, and his very disapproving cat, Olivia, and uh, part, who narrates part of the story. And it's, it's a bit of a litmus test for this book, actually, is if you get past the talking cat in chapter two, this might be the book for you. <laughs> if you don't, maybe not. Um, and so uh, Needless Street ends in this great wild Pacific Northwest forest that you find in where that kind of um, what an amazing kind of lush growth you find in Washington State. Right. Um, and children have been going missing in this area for some time, disappearances that have never been solved. And so one young woman called Dee um, comes to believe that Ted had something to do with the disappearance of her own sister um, at, at, at a nearby lake some years ago. So she moves in next door to him and essentially starts surveillance on him to try and ascertain if, if he might have had something to do with it. And then finally, when Lauren, Ted's daughter, goes missing, then events start to escalate. Um, it's very much, I, I, always, I always feel like this, it's very difficult to give a synopsis without giving spoilers, but also yeah. it's, it's also kind of a book that I think it uses the trappings and strategies of the Gothic and of horror in a particular way. So to describe it isn't really to describe it, if that makes any sense. I'm, I'm becoming more and more elliptical, I can tell. But um, well, one, of the, sort of one of the descriptions uh, of the book said, it, it said a little bit of what you just said, you know, all of these things are true and all of these things are not true. That's right. Yeah. Something to that effect. I think so. I mean, I, so I, for me, this is a book, I wanted to make sure that it was a book as much about compassion and survival as it is about horror. I don't know about you, but I think it's, it's about trauma and how the mind copes under unendurable strain. Um, I won't say any more than that, but it's, it's, I, I, I do feel sometimes, not always by any means, but I think horror can have a bit of a problem with its depictions of mental health and of, um, of trauma. Um, and I wanted to, I just thought I could do something a little bit interesting and different with it to tell a story that, uh, to tell a story in an, in, in, using all of those conventions, which I'm really fond of. I love horror. I love the Gothic, but using all those conventions to do something a little bit different so that it, it perhaps respected those stories. And, and as I said, had a bit of compassion at its heart, because for me, horror is all about compassion. I think that it's... That's in fact, well, it has to be, doesn't it? Because all I'm doing as a writer is sharing what I'm afraid of mm -hmm. and reaching out a hand to the reader and saying, are you afraid of this too? And let's walk through it together. Um, it's the most it's the most sort of extreme bond, I, I think, that you that you form between reader and writer because you're sharing something so intimate. Fear is intimate, isn't it? It's it, yeah. it's almost there's almost something shameful about it you, you you're not supposed to feel afraid as a grown-up anymore you're supposed these are supposed to be child childlike things childish things you you put aside you know especially so, uh as a as a male writer it, it's, it's right. not it's not right but it's, it's societal expectations are that men don't get afraid you know for the yeah. most part or you're have not any if you're a manly man, right? Right, right. Or have any <laughs> feelings at all, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Like it's a it's a big, it's a big sort of taboo. It's a great emotional taboo that we have. And I that's why I think horror is so cathartic. Um, and that it does let you experience these 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 less societally palatable feelings and perhaps even you know come through them um and and move beyond them. Um so that uh, yeah, so sorry, it's a long answer to your question. No, 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 please. Yeah. I I just I yeah, so I, I, I really wanted to make sure that this told a story that was um that 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 was based on compassion and empathy, particularly as some of the subject matter in it is very hard to deal with. Um, yeah. yeah. And yeah. Well, as I mentioned to you yesterday, we um we have live viewers and then more people watch it later and then even more more people listen to it later when I make it into a quote unquote normal yeah. audio podcast uploaded to iTunes and Spotify and all those places. So I say that to say that there are people watching live now with a couple of questions and comments. Yeah. One of and I want to get back to the 
the trauma and mm. compassion and horror and mental uh, health uh, slash illness uh, thing that you were talking about. Um, first of all, uh, Philip said, I just ordered the book now, excited to dive into it. Um, and a couple of very nice comments about the cover. And someone mentioned, I'm just cover. missing it. Uh, someone mentioned, oh yeah, the cover is by Corey Brickley. Okay. Yes. Yeah. He's amazing. I wanted to throw that out there because you can't judge a book by its cover, but certainly people <laughs> pull it off do. the literal shelf <laughs> or the virtual shelf and take a look at it based on the cover, you know, and then they decide yeah. from there. Um, but as far as uh, mental health goes and horror goes, can you talk a little bit more about why you wanted to delve into this and talk a little bit more about why you wanted to, wh why your, uh, why the theme of trauma and how it affects people? Um, well, I had, so, this, uh, this, oh, I've got so much to say. My, it affects, my brain so, is many teeming. People, it affects <laughs> yeah. so many people differently. Um, you said, I'm sorry, I, let me just finish that thought. Uh, you said that people often misinterpret mental health uh, and they don't understand mental illness. I have a very good friend who went to Iraq, was a soldier in Iraq, and he gives talks on PTSD. Yeah. And he gets very frustrated with people who think that PTSD is basically Rambo, you know, going mm. up and shooting everybody because they've got PTSD. And he said, that's not how P PTSD mm. works at all. As for example. Yeah. You know, so I think, I think, I think, that, I think that's right. I think, and I, I think that it's yeah, almost everyone will experience some kind of, um, some kind of, trauma in their life whether it's you know emotional or I mean and hope you know we, we hope that it's minor but right. it's, it's something that we all we will all come across um and that's why I think uh horror is is such a, a such a kind of a penetrating genre in that way is that you know for instance you look like romance actually not everyone gets to fall in love in their lives and and not and actually you know it's Perhaps that's not a necessity for happiness. Mm -hmm. Almost, but everyone will be afraid um, at some point. Um, that's a great it's, point. Un it's universal. Um, for me, for me personally, I remember um, just on the note on the in the on the subject of fear. I so when I was when we we can see behind we're, we're on Dartmoor now, which, which is a very wild place. Um, it looks a bit like Scotland, um, and it's this very kind of like old, um, quite spooky house. Um, and when we live, when I was well, you're in the right place. Right yes. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I get my ideas? <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> um, well, because I grew up um, all around the world. My father is a water economist, and we I was born in the states, and I grew up in Kenya, Yemen, um, Madagascar, and Morocco. And we, the one place we came back to every year was a house on Dartmoor. Not this house, I hasten to add, but um, I, there's something started to happen to me when I was 13, where I would wake in the middle of the night with a hand in the small of my back, pushing me out of bed. And I would fall on, I would fall on the floor and um, I would get up and I, it was probably the most frightened I've ever been. I'd get up and run to my sister's room and either climb into bed with her or, or, or sleep on her floor. And this happened every summer for, I think, because we come back to this house every summer. It was a one point of continuity in all this traveling. And for some reason, in all these summers, we never told a grown up. Like we never met, thought to mention it. It's, it's, it's that shame thing again, you know, especially when so much is changing and you're, you're becoming a teenager. There's this sort of, I, everything is so strange that maybe it didn't seem any stranger than anything else. But it, it was, I was so frightened. And it's a kind of fear that I don't think I've ever felt in the daylight, you know. Um, and when I first read my first kind of ghost story, which is The Monkey's Paw um, by W.W. W. Jacobs, which is very eerie, um, I felt that feeling again and I thought ah this is where you put it this is where you this is how you cage that feeling this is the architecture for that feeling and it was like a revelation because it was somewhere it was a way to it was a way to rationalize and channel something which seemed completely uncontrollable and I think writing does that in general but horror in particular does that and in in terms of I, th I think reproducing trauma and fear on the page it's in itself it has this almost magical function of disempowering the feeling or at least at least at least 
like caging it, as I said. Um, and I think that's almost a, has, yeah, it's almost magical that, that its capacity to to to, tra- to to take these feelings and and smooth them out onto something which not only can be ca- trapped on a page but also can be shared. I mean, it's the biggest sustained act of of you know empathy that you can that you can ha- that you can dream of. It's like capturing these really intense, raw, visceral feelings in, in in the text and then giving them to someone else. Well, which perhaps not that kind an act, but you know. Yeah, I was going to ask you about, I, I read somewhere about that. Uh, you were 12 or yeah. 13, I think, when this was going on. Yeah. Um, the hand on your back and so forth. Mm. Um, before I get to that, um, just to finish the thought, is that why you mm. think that we write, edit, and for that matter, great many uh, more people read or watch horror is because it is cathartic? Do you think that's, you know, because I think this question gets asked over and over again. It does, doesn't know, it? Yeah. Why do people... <laughs> why horror? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think I, mean, I think that's part of it. I, I also think that uh, horror has a function in that, you know, it, it's, it's a structure. It's, it's got a beginning, a middle and an end and a structure which um, f- makes it very comforting in a way. To feel frightened in a structured environment is... is is a kind of reassuring thing, um, because you know horror has plot and characterization and 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 progression and um, and you know copy editing and consistency, which life notably lacks. Here's um, horror, but I can control it because if I'm reading the book, I can yeah. put it down whenever I want. Or I think, yeah, yeah, and there's I think there's a sense as well. I often think about this because in terms of um, people's obsession with true crime, which I I share, mm-hmm. um, there's a sort of there's a sort of sense of maybe particularly for women and vulnerable people, I don't know, of if I can prepare enough for this by knowing enough about it. Like um, my psychologist friend of mine was talking to me about this and she was like, you can do one of three things with a threat. One, you can run away from it. Two, you can fight it. And, and, and three, you can make friends with it. And in a, and in a way, isn't, us trying to make friends with, and it, or at least know as much as possible about what might happen, and re- almost rehearse those feelings, so you'll yeah. be prepared in the moment when the when you know the unimaginable thing does does happen. I think there's a sort of similar function that true crime and, and horror play in that in that respect. So there's a sort of it, there's a sense of girding yourself, <laughs> armoring yourself against against you know terrible eventualities as well. Um, uh, yeah, I, I certainly I find that when I'm in times in stressful times, I do gravitate much more towards what you'd, I suppose, think of as being being like more like not 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 very nice things like serial killers and and um, and and stories of suffering. And I think there's there's perhaps there's a sense of like inoculating yourself against it. I don't know. It's interesting. Well, isn't when, it? when yeah, it is because when when COVID first started uh Mm. there were so many people watching and reading about uh you know viral apocalypses apocalypse apocalypses Um, yeah exactly my friend (laughs) paul he was he was he he came out with a book about it and he was he wrote it like a good fifth you know 15 months to a year and a half before because that's how publishing obviously works trembly yeah, yeah, Trimbley, sorry. I love, yeah. Yeah, he's... Well, he's wonderful. Uh, he's not only immensely talented, but a really nice guy, which I really mm. respect, you know. Um, but he's like, I feel bad about writing this book uh, mm. because now this is all happening, you know, but people people read it. Mm. And I, yeah, it's cathartic. It's their way of controlling it. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, he could, there's poor guy. There's no way he could have known. <laughs> No, that is know. that is some bad luck, um, yeah. or, or good luck, depending on how. You, I mean, it's a fantastic book, Survivor Song, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Really good. It is. Yeah, he's a great writer. My favorite of his is uh, Disappearance of Devil's Rock. I don't Ooh, know if you've I gotten to that one yet. No, I haven't. Oh, that's a good. He's actually he sent me um his his very new 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 one coming out next summer, the Paul Bearers Club, and I read the first few pages and I was like. Oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I was like eating it with both hands. Um, yeah, that's so, a trembling yeah. book. Yeah, there we go. I'm so excited. So I'm so excited to dive further into that. Uh, well, it, you know, we share a fascination with a movie called Lake Mungo. I don't know if you've seen it. 
but yes. if if not then this is my chance to um to proselytize and get another Brilliant. victim yes yeah it's it's a bit of a it's a faux documentary um and if you mm. watch it the, here's the best way to watch it watch it in the okay. dark first of all oh, and wow. yeah. you know you can't watch it during the day you have to watch it at night and <laughs> if you look it's not real it's fiction but if you go into it with the with the mindset you know uh, suspension of a belief and yeah, yeah. like i'm watching a documentary then it's a much more enjoyable watch well one of the themes in this movie um is uh, doppelgangers and mm. he implemented that a bit into uh, disappearance of devil's rock so mm. so uh, yeah. yeah check out the movie and after you watch the movie you'll have to email me and tell me what you think because amazing no I i'm will. surprised I will. paul hasn't wasn't been like a uh, dear cat read my book t.s watch lake mungo because he's so <laughs> gung-ho about it <laughs> so um let me get to a couple of audience questions and then i have obviously more questions um all right eric wants to know why uh with needless street why pacific northwest and not somewhere in england mm. uh britons that visit my neck of the woods fancy the familiar weather and setting so i'm curious why this book takes place in the states mm. so this is the only book of yours i've read so far um but i gather the others were set in the uk they were and i think it's partly um partly to do that partly the reason partly comes from the book and it partly comes from me so i despite talking like this um, you know, I'm American. I, I've actually lived more in my more of my childhood in, in America than I did, ever did in the UK, and um, the accent slipped a bit. But um, it's it, it's a part of me. And I, I my first two novels were very traditional, not traditional. I wouldn't say that they were historical Gothic, probably and maybe a little more close to the template of what one would expect from the Gothic. So it was this dual kind of urge really first of all to use to use a part of myself which I don't I don't I didn't think I'd really used as a writer like the windswept British moors tick did it <laughs> I had written yeah. two books like that and I think it, I come I just started I wanted to do to use a, di a completely different landscape also I wanted to use to transport the gothic into a landscape which I which it perhaps it doesn't naturally sit um, sit over, which um, in this case is the Pacific Northwest. And the other reason is that, um, as we know, Washington, Pacific Northwest and Washington State in particular have a pretty terrible track record as being the haunt of serial killers. Mm -hmm. um, it's they're they're riddled. And we've got Bundy, we've got the Green River Killer, we've got the I I five I nine five Killer, um, and it's land which can swallow you whole. It and does and has done. Um, there's this description of, so there's a, this, let me emphasize that this, this book is not based on any, anything in particular, but right. there is an event, event that reverberates for me through it, because I, it, I think the book holds my horror of this event, which is the Lakes and Mamish murders, which, which um, were committed by Ted Bundy, I think it was 1974, um, on Memorial Day weekend, and he abducted two women in one day, Janice Ott and Denise Nasland, um, and uh, he walked up and introduced himself by his name. And he said, I'm Ted. Uh, he had an arm and a cast, and he, that's how he lured them to wherever he lured them to, um, which is, he, they asked for help. He asked for help. So these women died for being helpful. Yeah. Um, and the idea, he, he tried it several other times. It only succeeded, I say only, succeeded twice. And I find that so unbelievably monstrous because you're supposed to be set. There were thousands of people on this lake shore crowded you know families friends and these people were not alone they were they were lured away from, from groups and, and family and it's just it shouldn't be it shouldn't it shouldn't be possible but it but it was and there's this um uh, robert keppel who i think was the washington uh it was a, one of the investigators on it was talking about the, the crime scene retrieval because they found denise nasland and janice ott a few months later on a neighboring hillside along with a third woman's remains who um were, it's not conclusively identified and he said that, you know there was no way they'd had no precedent for processing this crime scene because it was it had been overtaken by the wild so they would take they were basically taking apart coyote feces to get finger bones out 
and then and the birds and taking all the birds' nests down from these from this incredibly wild, you know, kind of untouched hillside because the birds had started making nests with human hair or with the, from the bodies. And I just thought, I mean, that's that is like your nightmares escaping your mind and calling out into into the real world, isn't it? That's and and that's it's it's the sort of fusion of the land. First of all, there's almost something quite reassuring about about the fact that the land cares so little for human action. You know, it's this, it's indifferent to us. It doesn't care about us. But there is no, it's, also it's been around for four point yeah. seven billion years before we got exactly. here, and it'll be around here when we're gone. Yeah. Exactly. So there's something. There's a sort of that 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 combination of the land being so, as you say, so much older and so, having so much more longevity than us as a species, but also being able, be, just being able to like to to conceal or, or for a person to be disappeared by it, by it, by you know, by design, by intention. Um, there's a sort of there's a sort of um, amazing kind of power to it and I, I i thought that it was it felt to me the only place this story could be set um and i i don't know if it, yeah no I, that that makes sense um to your point about how easy it was for ted bundy to lure these women um i recently interviewed a writer by the name of callie white um she wrote a book called the monsters we make yeah and it's set actually where i grew up in des moines iowa and in the early 80s, um, several uh, newspaper boys went missing that were actually around my age at the time, 11, 12. And I don't know if you've heard about the Johnny Gosh I, case. Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. That, that was in my hometown. I was wow. a year younger than Johnny Gosh. And, wow. And uh, yeah. it was fairly minor compared to some other things. But it really, I was like, oh, my gosh, this kid lives a mile away and yeah. he's been kidnapped. But my point is that she wrote a fictional account of this. Um, and in one of the, it, it was, part of it was the frustration. I could see Callie writing out the frustration of how easy it was for yeah. someone to lure these boys, you know? Yeah. And even she has a cop who really cares about solving these things, the, yeah. these cases. And he's in plain clothes in his regular car and he follows a kid home from the store uh, or starts to follow him home. And then he, if I remember right, asks him for directions, asks him if he needs a ride home, doesn't say he's a cop or anything. Yeah. And the kid is just like so trusting and gets in the car with him. And then in the fictional version, when the cop delivers the boy to his mother, he's like, I could have been a murderer. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. yeah. But this happened in real life, obviously. And this is Kelly's way of working it out. You know, it's so easy. And why why is it so easy? You know, you can see it in children, I suppose. But once we yeah. get to be adults, I guess it's still easy for it to happen to a lot of us. You know, especially if we care about somebody in an arm cast. You know? Yeah. I, yeah, exactly. And there's and there's this sort of thing which I rail, rail against a little bit, which is this sort of idea of the evil evil genius, because you know these these people aren't evil geniuses. What no. they what they are is taking advantage of 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 gaps in 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 our vigilance and in society and of people and of people's people's good nature. So it, it, it's that you know it's it's the vul, it's people's vulnerability that allows that or their um or their trust that allows them to be taken, not any particular, you know, charisma or intelligence on the part of the perpetrator. And I think there's, I think also, I mean, thinking about Needless Street as well, I just thought and it'd be so nice not to, not to play on that idea of like this, you know, maniacal genius serial killer that's evading the police at all, at all, you know, at, all, at every turn. I think, I think that's a, I think that's a construct and it bo it borders a little bit on, on kind of, um, um, you know, almost becoming a titillating thing, almost like you know, fi finding, yeah, fi you know, the worthy adversary, the cop and the killer, you know, Moriarty, it's, yeah, yeah, it's 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 it seems it seems it seems um, reductive and and not particularly helpful to me. You know, it's incredibly unfair, but it's a fact of life that women have to be more vigilant 
in yeah. general, very generally speaking, than men yeah. do. And, yeah. uh, you know, I've noticed in my life that if I'm alone in the, like walking down the street, you know, a few paces behind a woman or ahead or in any type of situation where yeah. it's just me and her, there's a natural inclination inclination and it's, you know, and it, there's probably should be because yeah, they just don't know, you know, yeah. to, to, you know, is this guy a nice guy or is he here to hurt me? And then yeah. I've got an illness that sometimes makes it so it's hard for me to walk. So there's a difference between when I don't have my cane and when I do right. have my cane. So, you know, what you yeah. were talking about these gaps mm. that these killers take, take advantage of, yeah. not that they're geniuses, but they're just finding, they're, yeah. they're finding their way through the cracks. That's, that's right. And it's, you know, I think with just with, you know, like technology and DNA, we're getting a lot. It's, it's no longer quite so possible for them to spread such a net for people to spread such a such a net. Um, yeah. But it's certainly, you know, have you know, have we solved have we solved these problems, these societal problems? No, I don't I don't I don't think so. There's one that wonderful book, The Five by Hayley Rubenhold. Do you know this? What, what is it about, called? I'm sorry. It's called The Five. And it's about, I mean, how many, I, you know, when I first heard of it, I thought, oh God, can I, can I possibly read another book about Jack the Ripper? But, <laughs> but it's different. It's just, it's all about her, um, it's all about the, the five um, canonical victims. And all it does is just list their lives. It turns out there's a lot, a lot of interesting stuff that they did. And then the final, the, and it's, it's wonderful because it overturns a lot of one's preconceptions about perhaps, um, you know, there's this sort of like bawdy kind of music hall idea of like, you know, they're, they're all like slatternly prostitutes who kind of were, who were out at night and got killed by a, you know, by a looming stranger. It, it, it seems, seems to have been a, a bit more complicated than that. And the, the last chapter absolutely broke, broke my heart. I was in floods because all it is, is just a list of things that they had in their pockets when they were found. And it's just it's so human. And there's everything from a bit of candle wax that they thought they'd need to a picture of a child to, and you just, it, it just elevates it out of this kind of, as I said before, almost like titillating kind of like victimhood into, into, into humanity. You just suddenly realize you see them as people. And I thought it was an amazing work of scholarship. Right. These women were far more than what they were more or less forced to do for a living. They were people, they existed, you know, they had, they had loves, they had people yeah. who cared for them, people they cared for. Yeah. You know? exactly. So I think um, that's right. Yeah. You're getting back a bit to your childhood fears and you know the hand on your back pushing you out of bed and so forth. I wanted to do ask let's get back to that. Oh yeah. Like, <laughs> I wanted to ask, um, do you believe in the paranormal? We've been talking a lot about the non-paranormal, but do, do you believe um, in the paranormal no, or ghosts or anything I, like that? I don't really, but the thing is, even though I do, uh, when, I did like when that when I had that experience, because there was no Google yet. I was right. pre Google for all, the best. I know what it, what it is now. I know what it is now, which is it's called a hypnagogic hallucination. I still get right. them actually. It's much easier now that you know where they are, but they're, they are absolutely terrifying. And so for some years, I thought I'd seen a ghost. And when I finally got a proper, a proper like diagnosis of it sometime in my 20s, it made it a lot easier. Um, I, was, I was suddenly like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. But I don't really, I don't believe, well, but the thing is, I don't really think it matters whether I believe in it or not. Um, as we all know, no matter whether I believe in ghosts, people have been seeing them ever since there have been people. Yeah. And will continue to see them until the, the end of people. So in a way, it doesn't just because it wasn't a ghost doesn't make my fear any less real. Um, I, or just because I, I don't think it's what's technically called a ghost. I, I don't think that devalues the experience. or, or No, not at all. And I, I don't, I, and I also don't, I don't think that people are wrong to be afraid of ghosts. These are, you know, these are ways of, pa of passing and, and decoding our fear and of expressing things which perhaps aren't difficult, are, are difficult to express. So the answer is, I don't think they literally exist. I do think they're extremely useful to us as humans. Um, and they tell, they tell stories about, about us that maybe we can't tell in any other way, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, about loss and history and the past and, and, and grief as well, a lot of the time. Um, so 
in the last house on Needless Street, one of the narrators of the book is Olivia the cat. Yeah. So I, I really love to hear, you know, I, I don't want to give you this, this, the dumb, where do you get your ideas question, uh, but I would love to hear the, where that came from and how that began. Well, we know we have already thoroughly uh, been into my fascination with serial killers. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, I, I'm particularly, I was particularly fascinated when I started out writing this book. Um, I was particularly fascinated about the relationship between serial killers and their pets. Because, um, and you can find examples of this all over. Um, Dennis Nielsen had a dog called Bleep, and Bleep was the only thing he cared about when he was arrested. Also, um, Myra Hindley had a dog, and get this, called po called Puppet. Not Poppet, Puppet. And that in itself is a nightmare on legs. Yeah. Um, but... Um, there, there's this incredibly intense relationship that, that these people without any emotional affect form with an animal. And I just thought how, how terrible it would be to be that animal. To be, it's another form of captivity and coercion, isn't it? You're forced into domesticity and, and to force to love someone who's extremely dangerous. And it's this paradox as well, because obviously serial killers, spend, they, they escalate usually from hurting animals and yet they have these very powerful relationships with their pets I, I just found it fascinating and I thought wouldn't it be awful to be that pet so I started writing and I, I thought it has to be a cat because cats dogs need to go places and you know um cats are cats have got that sort of I just also quite wanted to just write a cat I think but um I I started writing it and uh it it, it, it does have this horrible feeling of, of, of captivity and, and coercion, which I was really into. But um, it also wasn't big, big enough of a story. And, you know, you've, you've read the book. It's, um, it grew beyond that into, into a much larger story about trauma and about right. survival. But um, that's where it first came from, is this, terror, this almost, you know, the naive narrator being an animal who has no... Who, and, the, and the reader knows much more than they do about the situation they're in. Just thought, oh, well, she refers so to humans as Ted's. Yes, because she only knows one. Yes, she only knows one Ted. Yeah. <laughs> yes. so, know, Ted, yeah. Exactly. Uh, this is a quote from, I'm not sure where, someone who interviewed you. Uh, this is a quote from you. Uh, what do people see in a cat? What do they need from them? It's quite a moving relationship. They're fulfilling our desire, fulfilling our desire for something mystical and sphinx-like and unknowable yet slinky and friendly. There's a magic about a cat which we desperately need in these times more than ever, which I found interesting because uh, I have eight cats. So <gasps> yes! do, with, do yes. without what you will. So. Yes. You, I, I believe you, I've, I've seen some photos of a couple of very handsome fellows. Yes, those, those were the two outdoor yeah. cats. I've got a chair outside the door and, and they uh, snuggle there. So I think yeah. that they're interesting because we do project so much of our feelings onto them they they, they really don't think half the things we ascribe to them they're not really superior or um well I mean, who knows there's no way to tell but it's just their features are organized in a certain way aren't they whereby they don't make the same faces we do they don't have a they don't have a sort of like just you know the, the sort of emotion way same way of emoting as we do so we we, we find it easy to ascribe all of this like quite negative like superiority to them which i'm not sure they're probably just thinking about cheese um and napping. or something and napping yeah, yeah. um i love i did love writing olivia and I, I think it was a very divisive thing when the book was being sold like there was a huge my uh, there was a big uh kind of debate not on my part but people were saying you know if only if it was just like can we not have it be a cat could it be just like a, a, a woman he lives with and I'm like no it's a cat good for you it has to be well, and because here's the thing um when I read the description for this this book cat this was one of the things that grabbed me you okay. know there's a line and a cat who loves naps and reading the bible I thought yes. now if you're a, a voracious reader and you see that it's pretty hard not to grab, snap up that book and say, I want to read that, you know? Yeah. Oh, good. So it was a fight worth fighting. You, you did. <laughs> yeah. I think so. I and mean, people, people were just, a lot. there was a lot of puzzlement when I said, because the story of this book is, this is my kind of, am I allowed to swear? No. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Waiting. Please, oh, for the love okay. of God. So Damn this it, is swear. my, this is, <laughs> so this is my fuck you book. Um, yeah. 
because you know i i although quite critically or you know very kindly received my first two books like especially little eve it's all which is the second my second novel which won the shirley jackson in the end but sold minus copies its first year out i don't even know how that's possible <laughs> it's, it's just you know it was very very difficult to get another publishing deal and i just thought i don't know how many times i'm going to get to do this again um and if i'm going to do it i want to write the mad crazy anarchic book of my heart and and make and make it something it's something I've never read before I want to I want to write the book that I've never read that I, I'd love to see this sort of you, you know, just took the words so, right out of my mouth that yeah. yeah uh writing the book that you would want to read and fighting for that yeah ex exactly and so in terms of that, I, I, I really didn't, if I didn't think as much as people usually have to about, I don't know, shelving or marketing or placement in the market or, and I, I just, I just wrote it. And it was very much like, I'm basically probably dead in the water anyway. So it doesn't really matter. As it turned no, out. I that think that's wrong. a really good lesson. I have a lot of uh, writers and aspiring writers who listen to the show as well. And, and I think that's a very good lesson for writing or really so much of uh, of any art that you're creating right. is not to write for the market right for write what you feel deeply about what you want to write um there were some games that came out in the late 90s uh one called mist i don't know if you've heard of it but i played mist you played mist yeah yes. well so then you know how groundbreaking it was at the yeah. time and i was really get out of that spaceship yeah, I was reading online about it at the time, and someone said, I think these guys create the kind of games that they want to play. Yeah. And I've never forgotten that. And I think yeah. that applies to authors like yourself as well. You I know. think also there's a, there's a tendency to patronize readers a little bit, maybe. And uh, obviously, I understand publishing is a business, um, and mm -hmm. it sh as, it, as, it, as it should be, and I, I get that. But I think readers are a lot more elastic and bold than maybe the market gives them credit for they yeah. can totally handle a talking cat who reads the bible and narrates part of the book they totally can it's, it's the proof is there um and i think i i do understand you know that people have got to earn a living and and it's a risk it's quite a risk averse industry but i just think occasionally there's room for a little a little out there stuff you know well you know it's different is good i don't know how many times yeah. i've had that thought when i've read something just out yeah. there you know like this that really but it really works um but it, to your point about cats i'll tell you a story and i think my son is listening so he'll be him, he's my tech guy he'll appreciate this um my son about six or seven years ago my son's 19 now and he was about 10 11 at the time and my wife and and he were out biking and Logan, my son, found was was riding past and he found these two cats underneath. I think it was a shed or something. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And there were these two tiny kittens. And I remember him and her calling me on the phone. Can we take these kittens home? And he was just just sobbing that anyone would yeah. do this to these kittens, just abandon them. Well, my point is that they were they were two brother kittens. They grew up together yeah. with us, so on and so forth. So about three years they were they're called uh george and charlie so about three years ago we lost george he had oh, some sorry. sort of illness and it really came on fast and we lost him and it was very heartbreaking now george had this habit of what we called tucking my wife in at night whenever my wife and i went to bed george would immediately run up and lay down on her chest put his paws on her you know like that and like purr for a while and mm. kind of make sure she was in bed. And a lot of the times he would even go, it was almost like he was looking at the clock, tapping his fingers going, it's time for you to go to bed. <laughs> Charlie, his brother never did this. Mm. Not once. Mm. Charlie was more, he was, he hung around me a lot more really. And George was kind of Danielle's cat. Immediately after George died, Charlie started doing that same thing. Wow, and I just cannot explain it. I don't, I don't understand it at all. And you're right. I think we do attribute a lot of human emotions to cats that they don't have, and then 
out of nowhere, they do these strange things, things that we don't even understand. They, I, I mean, everyone who everyone has, has who's had cats um, knows the experience of being comforted by a cat. Yeah. So somehow they seek you out and they know when you're upset. It's quite extraordinary. And um, there's that scene in which just could directly from my experience, because I had a black cat growing up called Velvet who came with us. We got her in Kenya. No, we got no, we got her in the States. And then she came with us to Kenya, Madagascar, Yemen, Morocco, back to the States, where she finally she finally died at the age of 17. But she she knew all of us so well. And I I just I, she, she was like a part of the family and she just but it, her, her ability to sense when you needed her was quite uncanny yeah. and she was a very so strange you say that she was one of two siblings as well and her brother died and her brother had been the very outgoing one she'd been very held back as soon as he died she started to take on all of his little characteristics it's really strange you say that because I've, I've is, witnessed that yeah. firsthand yeah 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 well you are the first person who has told me this I told this story yeah. a couple times on the show because it's so mind-boggling yeah, I'm really happy. You know, happy that someone else has had this experience, yeah. which means probably there are a thousand other people who will never get to meet who've had it. You know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. Oh, they're it's wonderful, though, aren't they? I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, so creatures. anyway, the, the book is the Last House on Need the Street. It's available in print and Kindle and audio. Um, <laughs> I I just actually got the audio book for you. Uh, you guys sent me uh, an ARC, which I really appreciated. Thank you. Um, but I bought the, I'm an Audible member, so I used one of my credits and bought the audio book for my mom um, because she loves listening to my audio books. And I told her she would really love this book. So so she's oh, going to be okay. doing that very soon. So um, I will say on the, the audio book, it is absolutely uncanny the narrator christopher ragland does i thought when i first listened to it that there were three different there was three different narrators i genuinely yeah. thought there was a cast of three he's extraordinary it's it's amazing and it's funny that you said that i published a book a few years ago um called the sea of ash by scott thomas it's a novella mm-hmm. and i published it because I, I he gave it to me to read it had been previously published but it was sort of one of those stories that you're talking about. It kind of sold negative copies. Nobody knew anything about yeah. it. You know, it wasn't that bad, but it was close, you know? Yeah. And I thought, man, what an amazing story. Um, more people deserve to read this. You know, you know, says, Scott, can I republish this? Uh, new cover and, and all that. Well, yeah. then about a year or two after that, I paid someone to um, do an audiobook version. And there's, there's three different protagonists in this book yeah. in three different centuries. And I never thought about it going in when I asked uh, Lehman Kessler to read this. I only realized just how difficult of a job this is, how much more this is than yeah. just sitting down, opening pages and reading. Yeah. And yeah. because he came up with a unique voice for each character, I was blown away. So yeah, you, you, to hear that about this book, that it sounds like an amazing read, as far as yeah. the narrator. I mean, also because I write, I it really, I've only realized this quite recently. Is I I write in, I write almost exclusively in first person, almost monologues, and it lends itself quite well to to like an you know an audio experience. Um, I trained as an actor. I, don't, I never know if this how much impact that has, but I definitely, I definitely think maybe it has it has some. You know, my my preferred my preferred sort of like mode of storytelling is like, is, is the sort of almost dramatic monologue. Um, and I still use some of those weird tools as well, not weird tools, some of those like building blocks that actors use about, you know, breaking down a scene with like obstacles and, and objectives and, yeah. and, and activities. And um, it's something that comes across in audiobooks. Audiobooks are wonderful. They're, I love being able oh, to yeah. hand over your work to someone else and just go deal with it, <laughs> make it sing. <laughs> um, well, just, I believe if you if you've hired what you believe who you believe is the right person for the job yeah. at that you know you've done your job now you found who you think is the best but now you need to get out of the way and let them do do their job which is so relaxing actually it is like... yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, I literally he gave it back to me I literally I changed one thing it, it, yeah. everything else it was just like can you pause <laughs> a little bit right here on this sentence you know everything else is perfect <laughs> he's like yeah no problem Mike <laughs> so. Um, so uh, 
I, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I do have a few more questions for you. Sure, yeah. As far as um, speaking to the audience now, the last house on Needless Street, um, like I said, print, Kindle, audio book. And Stephen King read the book. He said it was a nerve shredder. Some kind words from Stephen King. That's great. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, more congratulations. <laughs> yes, I bet. Um, I bet it was. Um, and more congratulations. Andy Circus um, read it and said, if I remember right, this is the kind of book that only comes along once in a lifetime, which is, I think, ex that's amazing praise. Right. I mean, I mean, what do you even say? Yeah, I know. I just I mentioned this. I think I mentioned this to you earlier, but my God. So I, I, the whole idea, the whole idea that Andy Serkis knows my name and, and or Stephen King knows my name is itself kind of crazy. But so we had this I um, we had this Zoom, I had the Zoom with the Imaginarium just before we signed the deal. And um, yeah. it, it was a bit annoying as we were saying, like, because it would have been, a, if, if it wasn't for the pandemic, it would have been a meeting. I would have been able to like go and right. meet, like have dinner or something. But as right. it was, it was just another bloody Zoom. But Yeah, show up at the restaurant. Um, Andy Circus's table. Oh, there he is. Hey. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, as Zooms go, what a Zoom. But right. it's still a fucking Zoom. Right. Um, and um, so I, I was on the call with him and he just, he just, he was kind of, He's very charismatic and just loves the book. And, and it was blew me. They all blew me away. The entire company was just so on board with it. But he did this thing, which just kind of made my mind go, where, um, whereby he's, uh, he was going, oh, so Kat, what I really, what I really like about, you know, I, what I really like and connect with about this book is like, well, it's partly about what you said about, you know, horror being in the liminal spaces in between, which is something I said in a podcast in 2014. So, Andy Serkis googled me <laughs> like, and listen to the um, podcast and then listen to, or I don't know maybe had a researcher do it I don't know I like yeah. to think he did it but um it was, well, it was a very know, they're, surreal they're, experience there are they're people too right you know yeah. so absolutely I just it was very surreal having Andy Serkis quote me back to myself from something <laughs> I'd said like eight years ago well it's well deserved um and oh, I really enjoyed you. the book and for anyone who hasn't read it um, you know, it, I would suggest the, the same thing that I say about so many movies. Uh, don't watch the trailer. And in this case, don't don't read any reviews. Just go into it blind. So yeah, good because advice, you'll yeah. be rewarded if you do that. Now, you've had a couple of books just briefly. You've had a couple of books out already and you have a book coming out, I believe, in March. Um, can we talk Did about you? these three briefly? Of course, yeah. I'm very gladly. Uh, let's um, start with the first two that are that are out there already. Mm. Um, Little Eve and what was the other one? I, I want to pick these up. And I, oh, I, I looked, Little Eve sounded so fascinating to me when I read about it. And I was like, no, no, there's no Kindle version. No. I know, <laughs> I, know I know, I know. Well, ah, the good news is Little Eve is being re-released by, um, not re-released, it's having its first US release with Nightfire in October of 2022. So it's going to have its, its US debut, as it were, which is really exciting for me because it's always been, it's always been like... Uh, they're all passion projects, but it's my it's my great unloved passion project. And I I really I mean talking about Paul Tremblay, Paul Tremblay, I think was on was on the jury for the Shirley Jackson, which selected it yeah. to win. Yeah. And he's I mean, I, I cannot tell you how much I, it, it that book owes to, to that award because as I said, it had very little else going for it. Um but so Little Eve, Little Eve is about a young woman who may or may not have um murdered her entire family in a snake worshipping cult in some standing stones on New Year's Eve 1920 on a Scottish island. That's the plot. Um, and I may or may not have done that myself. <laughs> exactly. Who can Heavily recall on everything? May not. Heavily on the may not have, but still. <laughs> well, who, who can remember everything one's done today? Exactly. Um, but yeah, it's... my and my son thinks I'm fifty thousand years old anyway, so I was around then. <laughs> I I I I loved writing this book because it allows you to again do what I love best, which is um go into a a mode of being and, and way of thinking which is completely um completely isolated and and strange. So it's a cult. It's a snake worshiping cult. 
um, after the just after the First World War, um, on in on an isolated island in Scotland, and I I just I, I love the way that I love exploring the links to which the human mind will go in all sorts of ways, and in this particular instance, the how far can you take belief before it starts to crumble? How far can you? Um, because I think there's a bit, there's a big question in this book about whether what's going on is supernatural or not. And I think the answer might not be the one you expect, but um, either it's, it's you know, cult brainwashing or it's real. And well, I, I, this is, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Laird Barron and I did a, he, a show for my Patreon podcast uh, several months ago. And it was because I was on the phone with him like a couple weeks previously. And just out of the blue, we started talking about strange but true things that have happened to us and he's talking about this stuff and i'm just that, that have happened to him and i've just getting chills go down mm -hmm. my back and but the point i'm trying to make is that he's like if this speaking of a particular incident several incidents if it's paranormal it's yeah. scary as hell and if it's not paranormal it's scary as hell it's scary as hell yeah, yeah that's it either there, way. There are there are no good answers right um, yeah <laughs> there's no way you win with this you know situation so back back to the book yeah it, it could be or not be it could not be supernatural could 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 not be and it's so we work backwards from the murders um and you half and we work backwards and forwards almost so in a line the, the book starts here and then but you have two two kind of um, parallel narratives. One told by the surviving sister Dinah, and one told by Eve, who um, is the murderer in the days leading up to the murder. So you get but you get the run up and the aftermath, and you open with with the event. Um, and it's it's also it's she thinks she can read minds. That's her that's her power. She can she and um, she Eve. takes that. Eve thinks she can read minds, yeah, and she takes that power out, you know, into the marketplace. And again, you've got this beautiful, like, very difficult for me to write because without giving the game away, like, is what she's doing reading minds or is it also a sort of a version of cold reading? Right. And um, the, and also sometimes, it, it, I think it shows also that sometimes people who are victims, like, for instance, of, of, of a cult, doesn't necessarily mean that they are nice people you can you can have you can, trauma can trauma and depression and all sorts of things can turn you into someone who's actually quite dangerous um and i i loved exploring that as well um although not in the conventional sense of like you know all people who've been abused turn into serial killers which i and hate that trope but um i think there is a sense that sometimes um in the powerless le need seek out any power they can get um, and I think in, in this particular instance, it leads to very, um, very, um, very uh, drastic consequences. I just also my there's a sort of personal element with the setting as well. It always is with mine with my books, but with Scotland. So my mum, my mother was born in Ayr, which is in the Highlands, mm -hmm. and then she moved when she was four to Zimbabwe and she grew up there. And she with her with her brothers, and all of them have this. They have this amazing nostalgia for a land they never knew. So it's kind of incredible that you, you see that they have this great longing in, for, the, for the homeland yeah. and for Scotland. And, and sometimes they, and they have like the traces of Scottish accents, which they, it's almost, it seems almost impossible to have retained after, after you know, leaving at, at, well, at six or 10 years old, but they do. And I just thought, I really want to put that longing into that book, into this, you know, the, the longing for the longing for something which you didn't, which you never really knew. And also perhaps the longing for something which, which wasn't that good for you. You know, the, the, um, when yeah, you, the, yeah. And you spoke of the power of belief and you spoke of this book about what, you know, another reason why people want to believe in, in something like a cult is because humans in general have this, need for absolute answers yeah. if you can find somebody that's going to give you absolute answers you know yeah. say if you follow me everything will be okay that's a simple simplification but you know it's nice it's 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 comforting i think catholicism offers a similar sort of set of you know um in particular i'm thinking of absolution confession and absolution god yeah. that sounds that sounds relaxing you know it it just sounds so wonderful you you tell someone what you've done and and you are absolved um, but yeah. I digress. Um, 
I think I think that that's exactly it is to be told the right and the wrong of it is what we're all seeking all the time. You know, we're desperate to know what the best way to live our lives is. Well, when you leave a cult, um, even uh, when you leave, and, and in this context, I'm talking about a dangerous cult, like in your right. book, I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, even years later, it, it's you, you can recognize that it was very bad for you, that it was very, very damaging, yeah. extremely so. But there's always this little part of you that it wishes that you still had that clarity of knowing what yeah. was right and what was wrong, even though you now know it wasn't right. But you, you felt secure in that knowledge, you know? Do you think there's a sort of correlation to the way, um, to, to, a, to a sort of physically abusive relationship and the way that the emotionally sinks its hooks into you? Do you think there's a sort of like, um, why people don't why people almost why people almost opt, opt to stay in something which is obviously very yeah bad for i you. mean i think so i i grew up in one and yeah it it is amazing that there are nice people i hope i'm a nice guy try to be that survived it and then there are people who i know are just absolute jerks um you know that have killed people Right. And that survived it as well. And I'm like, That's, okay, yeah. so what pushes one person this way? What pu- pushes another person this way? I, I don't know. You know. There's still no, yeah, God, that's that's gripping. What, do you mind me asking what what a bit more about your upbringing? I mean, I don't know oh, if you want to go into it. You don't have to. Uh, I'm actually from, I, I was born in Texas when we were six. Uh, and I, oh, this was the ultimate, you know, my wife, my, excuse me, my mom had three sisters. Each sister had cousins. We all lived in the same area. It was like, it was so great. You know, I played with my cousins all the time and everything. So suddenly my mom and dad told me that we're moving to a quote unquote church up North in Des Moines, okay. Iowa. You know, this is just out of the blue. Yeah, so my dad tells me, he goes, no more TV. You can't have a bike. Um, you're not yeah, I was supposed to start first grade he goes you're not oh. going to start first grade um, you know you're going to go to their school which is heavy um, quotation marks there because from first grade to 12th grade there were like 50 kids yeah. so <laughs> so um, you know and then when you grow up in that I, I don't know I'm kind of angry at the adults that fall for that um, right or wrong but as a kid growing up in that, you don't just, it's not something you believe or you hope is true. It's something that you quote unquote know is true because you don't know anything else, you know? Of course. And well, children, children believe what you have to believe the world that they're, they're given. That's, that's all Yeah. They and it, it, it's, it always seems to create this environment that's very conducive to, to child abuse and other kinds of abuse. You know, because it's about power. Yeah. It is. It yeah. is absolutely about power. Yeah. So it sounds like you, uh, well, you wrote a book about cults, so obviously, but it sounds like you know uh, something about the subject. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's like, you know, the evil that men do follow after them. Mm. Um, you know, you throw a rock into a pond. Um, some guy does something to a kid in 19... 19- 81 and you know 40 years right. later that kid and maybe his kids or other people are still suffering from that that ripple absolutely yeah you know and there's it so doesn't... many of those I, a lot of ruined lives to answer your question but yeah. you know you could it's you can dwell on that or you can think about the fact that you're not six feet under and be grateful for yeah. that you know so but I'm, I'm, you know, because of that, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by cults too, and fascinated yeah. by other people's takes on them. So, yeah, um, I will be in, uh, ordering the print copy of that book since there's not a Kindle copy. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I am looking forward to reading it. Really. Well, we should. I'll get Nightfire to send. Also, it might be a bit of a long wait, but we should get Nightfire to send you a new, a new beautiful edition of their new one next year. Oh, I, mean, I wouldn't. You may not want to wait that long. I wouldn't say no. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I can find other things to read till then. Okay, good. But uh, yeah, I, I saw um, some comments. People saying they're gonna they're gonna read that. 
I'll order that right now. So that's oh, yeah. wonderful. It's my unloved. It's my unloved evil child. So. It sounds like a fascinating book. Um, so all that said, let's finish this up with asking you about your book that's coming out in March. Yes. Tell us about yes. that one. And we can um, pre-order this now, right? Yes, you absolutely can. Okay. Um, Great. So this is um, Sun, Sundial, um, which uh, is set in the Mojave Desert mainly. Um, it's about uh, a, a mother and a daughter mainly, Rob and her daughter Callie. And Rob comes to understand that Callie's dangerous and that she means harm to her younger sister. So she takes her away out of there. All Rob has ever wanted is a normal life, is this a beautiful suburban, perfect, you know, like untro untroubled surface. Right. Uh, which she got, but unfortunately, things are not all things. These things, um, the cracks begin to show, and um, so she, when she understands that Callie's dangerous, she takes Callie um, away from their suburban house uh, into the desert, back to the place where she grew up, where she grew up, and which is a sort of almost like a facility called Sundial, um, and she it's just deserted, empty, derelict now, and she sits her down. She says, "This is why you need to be." careful of what you are and she tells her the story of their upbringing and then as these stories um converge um you start you start to understand that eat both um callie and rob each one of them thinks the other is going to kill them um and i so for me the mother-daughter bond is such a powerful thing because mine is very healthy i love my i love my mother so much and there is nothing but i almost think that empowers me to explore more about if it I worked. saw an interview where, you, where your mom's like this isn't me right uh you're not writing about oh my, me <laughs> they literally they literally ask me that with every book they're like it's not oh my us gosh. is it <laughs> there's, I'm like, there's, no. there's one in uh needless street that's all I'll say yeah. I know I know well so my my parents are very very different to this but what I do think oh is your answer is mom you're so great that you showed me exactly what not what not to do and what you know I just go the opposite when I'm writing well, about well, evil, exactly. evil mothers. <laughs> Which is the truth. <laughs> um, I think that like, it, yeah, I, th I think that if something's so important to you, like a mother daughter bond, then it's, it's it, the imagination of, of how that could go wrong is very powerful. So that's, what's so scary for me is like, if this became misaligned and, 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 uh, and malign, but um. Yeah, I, I also think I do think the, it can be sanitized. There's, there's, there can be this impulse to sentimentalize or sanitize this relationship between mothers and daughters. I think that's very powerful. It's very atavistic. I think there are lots of un, again, like unpalatable, unacceptable feelings in it. But it doesn't make it any less, any less real, true, or loving. So that's what I'm exploring. Is this is the kind of more the more savage side of that relationship, and indeed whether one of them does in the end kill the other so we'll see <laughs> um another comedy from katrina ward oh yeah um, another uh <laughs> another it's kind of a um relaxing wrong rom-com where yeah, you know, learn a life a, lesson yeah, and, yeah. Ex exactly opens with an aerial shot of new york and right. voice it'll over. probably be it'll probably be going the lifetime so, you know. <laughs> exactly um but but also it um it also deals quite extensively with some of the um, the, the mk ultra experiment by the CCIA oh, I'm so glad you said that because I was going to uh -huh. ask you and I forgot. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I could not invent shit as crazy as what those guys did. So, um, I, there's oh, one yeah. in particular which I, which I took, um, because I just thought, um, it was one which was abandoned because there was no practical use for it, and I thought, how greedy! And it's one on. I'm afraid it's, it's, it's an animal experiment, um, and I know that this is difficult. It's difficult. I don't like writing it, but it did happen, and I thought what an egregious use of your time to do something just because you in the you know that famous quote of Jurassic from Jurassic Park you know you too busy thinking about whether you could and you never stopped to think about whether you should yeah. um and um so I really wanted to to memorialize that in in a book it's it's quite I, I, yeah it, it meant it meant a lot to me so yes lots of <laughs> lots of I guess we said comedic elements um I, I'd like to really uh, remind everybody once again that you know it is kind of human nature at least it is with me maybe everybody else is exactly different but to in the past you know, come upon a book I'm interested in oh it's not coming out for three months um, I can pre-order it but yeah wait till it comes out and then I'll get it but you, you know what I've learned and 
for those in the audience who are not sick of hearing this, um, it really helps the writer, the author, and the publisher um, to get pre-orders. It gives them a better sense of how the book's going to do. So, you know, if you're at all interested in in, in Cat Ward and her books, and you this looks like a book that you're going to get when it comes out, go ahead and pre-order it. You know, and you can do the same with the audio book too. So... And I can add that also Corey Brickley, who did this amazing Needless Street cover, also did the cover of Sundial, which is a dog's skull with a snake crawling through it against the backdrop of a desert night. I oh, it is a it comedy. <laughs> Perfect for the comedy it, it, it encloses. Um, but, oh, it's amazing. It, I cannot try. I, I don't know. I, yeah, I haven't got one with me because I'm not at home, but um, it is. It's aces. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't mention uh, Last House on Needless Street when we were talking about Andy Serkis. Uh, the, possibly there's going to be a movie. He wants to make this a movie. Yes. And it's never right. a sure thing, but it looks pretty good, as it seems to me, from looks the outside. Good. I mean, it looks, it, they, they are the right people to do it. They are so incredibly enthusiastic and um, they have so many ideas. And I think. Um, everyone from on that zoom call i mentioned earlier they had every single person in the company on that zoom call and every single wow. person had read the book and each one of them said something i mean i can't even get a friend in a room for a cup of coffee that was incredible <laughs> <laughs> that was incredible <laughs> incredible management and i i just i i know that whatever they do with it they're going to do something really special um oh. it as you know you know what it's like that they, they, they there's a lot and then nothing happens for ages and then everything happens at once and right. we're, we're just we're, we're waiting on news but i think it's going to be hopefully there'll be some very soon well congratulations on that too it's Thank well deserved so, much, so Thank you. yeah and um it's nice to know i'm sure uh from your uh, standpoint that it's in the hands of people that you think get it you know yeah it's really nice and also that they are willing to let me be a part of it and have a seat at the table I mean most of the time I think when they're when people are adapting books they're just like get the writer out of the room right <laughs> understandably because we don't know but um they've been really they've yeah they've they've been really open to me I've got an exec producer title and it's oh nice yeah, no more Anne Rice situations from that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. She actually um, sees, you know, Tom Cruise is not the person for this. And then she I sees know. the movie and she's like, ah, I was wrong. <laughs> well, he was, that was, I have a, I've got such an affection for that movie. I think it's fantastic. I do too, I love it. Yeah. I love it, I know. Yeah. Who knew? Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt, who knew? Yeah. Well, I mean, the casting directors of that movie obviously knew. But. Well, I remember reading about the time, and 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 the director said, and right, a very uh, PC politely said, yeah, yeah. Anne Rice is a great writer. She is not a casting director, or you know, so which is both factually <laughs> true and a and a bit of a burn. <laughs> yeah. So when the when the movie comes out before it comes out, she's got full page ads in the newspapers yeah. saying. I was wrong. Read the, watch this movie. No. Oh well, she God. was wrong. He was great. Yeah, he oh. did a great job. Oh, and then what I remember also is because that was my teen years as well. I remember so vividly that River Phoenix was supposed to take the Christian Slater part of the journalist. And you're just like, Christian Slater was great, is it, right? Amazing. Yeah. But you can't help missing River Phoenix, can you? Like, you were in your teens. Yeah, it must have been like uh, 13, I think, or so. Oh, God. I mean, you're making me feel old. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, so the name of the new book is Shelter? S Sundial. Sundial, I'm sorry. Um, no, don't worry. S Sundial, and it's coming out in March. Mm -hmm. So please go to, go to Audible or Amazon or wherever and pre-order the book, folks. Um, you know, I'm sure you'll be glad you did. And if you haven't read The Last House on the Street, that you're in for a treat. So, um, yeah. Thanks for talking to me, Kat. Oh, well, thanks so much for having me, Mike. I loved it. Um, I've been, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't stop. I could barely bring myself to a halt. <laughs> That's all right. It makes my job easier, like I said yesterday. So, anyway, thanks for being on the show. Um, and um, 
congratulations on all your all your success it's well deserved thank you so, so much and thank you thank you so much again for having me and thank you to everyone who watched and is listening yes. and it means so much thank you thanks guys and i will see everybody at the next podcast on sunday thanks cat thank you bye